HP 4th Champion PTA. Harry awoke Christmas morning feeling stiff and sore from the previous day's races. It had felt like an eternity since he'd competed like that, and his body was making him pay for it. Still, as he lay in his bed, he just could not stop smiling. Harry had the opportunity to introduce his friends to Sirius and Remus, the latter of which knew nearly everyone. As he had been their defense teacher the previous year. They celebrated with Harry and his friends and then went to speak to Dumbledore, as they did at least once a month. Harry guessed they dropped off his presents as well, as they had plans to journey south into London the next day. As Harry would be quite occupied, Sirius felt it would be a very good time to go call on a few old friends. Harry was momentarily saddened knowing he wouldn't see his godfather on Christmas. But it passed when he sat up and beheld the very large mountain of packages waiting to be opened. The first gift he snatched up was from his best friend Mark. Harry opened the envelope first and read Mark's messy scrawl. Harry, wow, it's still weird writing that. Look, when I see you, if I call you James. Well, you're just going to have to deal with it. So, a lot's happened here. First off, we're doing terrible at Quidditch this season. It's like the spark has gone out of the team. You need to come back and whip these guys into shape. Seriously. On the other hand, our race team is doing better than ever. Maybe you were holding them back all this time. Haha. <laughs> Actually I think it was that Hanson and Travis graduated. I think you'd be in the top five this year now that they're gone. Kelly and I broke up, though I think I saw it coming for a while. She'd been flirting with that total dick Ken Waters. You know, that big jackass with the really strange looking chin? Yeah, well. They started going out. I was bummed, until Jennifer Bakerson started talking to me. Jennifer Bakerson. We've been dating three weeks now. She is so much cooler than we'd ever hoped she could be. Looks, brains, and she's got this incredibly dark sense of humor. It's like we're meant to be, Stacy and I still hang out. She told me that the headmaster for that school you're at came to talk to her parents about her attending some ball with you. She was really upset that she couldn't go. Dude, I think I should tell you. I don't know if you've been writing to her or not, but... Brace yourself. She started going out with Duncan. Yeah, our Duncan. I kind of think she's dating him just because she can't be with you and I would never cross that line. I know how much you like her. I can't say I blame her, really. She's super hot, and you're not here at all. I just thought you should know. Anyway, I need to get this out so you get it by Christmas. I hope you enjoy your gift and show it off to all your new friends. I miss you. It's just not as fun getting into trouble without you here. Mark P.S. Thanks for all the pictures of your friends. The picture of that girl Tracy is the most popular picture in our dorm. Let her know she has a growing fan club. Harry laughed hard as he imagined letting Tracy know that she had admirers across the pond, and he picked up Mark's gift. He tore off the wrapping to find a photo album overflowing with pictures from his first year at Salem Academy to the presence. Every page had photos of his friends waving and running and making faces. The last ten pages were all pictures of his friends and teachers taken quite recently, the last one being Mark standing next to Jennifer Bakerson, who was holding his hand and leaning against him as he waved. Duncan a thin boy with longer dark blonde hair and a sly grin hand stuffed into the pockets of his trousers. And Stacy, looking just as beautiful as she had the last time he'd seen her. Harry felt a stab at his heart as he looked at Duncan and Stacy. Sure, she was free to date whomever she wished. 
After all, he wasn't there, so they couldn't be together, but still, he felt a bit betrayed that Duncan had stepped up. Yet, at the same time, he couldn't think of anyone other than Mark who would treat Stacy the way she deserved. Closing the album, he set it aside. Deciding he would take it to breakfast to show his friends, and dub into the rest of his presence. Sirius and Remus had gotten him several interesting new things, including a pocket's neacoscope, new Quidditch gloves, and to Harry's astonishment, a dragon hide jacket. Made from a Hungarian horntail. Harry ran his fingers over the black material and smiled. The jacket was simply too cool for words. Hermione had gotten him a very nice broom servicing kit, which was kept in a leather case. Duncan had sent him a set of omnioculars with the last school race recorded on them. Forget what Marx says, we needed you out there. The note had read. Harry had to agree after he watched the dismal performances of his teammates. Tracy and Daphne had gone in together on Harry's gift and gotten him a very fine silver chain with a fang of some sort on. It. Harry put it around his neck at once, admiring how macho it made him look, and then laughing when he heard Sirius and Remus laughing at him in his head. Having Sirius as a godfather had the wonderful effect of keeping you humble. Cedric had given him a book on advanced transfiguration. Harry read through a few pages quite captivated by some of the spells held within. Harry felt he would need to study this book carefully. Harry opened Mandy's gift to find a book on runes. Harry remembered more than a few conversations with the shy brunette in the library revolving around their mutual interest in the subject. Harry thought it might come in handy in future assignments. Hannah had gotten him a rather fancy set of inks and quills, with a note which told him that he was to use it to write his friends. No matter where he went. Susan had sent him a journal, which she had written in the first page. Harry, this is a self dictating journal. All you need to do is set the quill it came with on the page, and then speak out loud. It's similar to a quick quotes quill. The journal is charmed so that only you can read it, too, so it will always be private. I hope that you will use it to document your time here at Hogwarts, so that you never forget the people whose lives you impacted the most. Mine especially. I am so grateful that I've had the opportunity to become your friend over the last few months. After spending time with you and getting to know you, I felt that you might appreciate something like this journal. Love Susan Harry made a mental note to specially thank Susan for her thoughtfulness. He dove back into his pile of presents, which had been seriously decimated now. He found a book on Quidditch teams of Europe from Neville. There was a package from Stacy which contained a very warm looking scarf and matching gloves. For those cold winter nights. When you have no one to keep you warm. I miss you. XOXO the note had read. It came with a picture of the two of them taken right before autumn break, moments before she had kissed him, and then his life got all discombobulated. Even Ginny, whom he'd barely spoken to, had gotten him a small crystal dragon, which he set on his bedside table, where it would catch the sun each morning. The most interesting gift yet was from Luna. Harry suppressed a shiver as he tore open the paper. He was torn between laughing and finding the girl to discern the meaning of the gift. After all, he'd never received underwear from a girl before. Harry felt he should consider himself lucky that they were boxers. They could have been something truly embarrassing. Truth was, they weren't bad. Three pairs, all of which were decked out with different patterns. His favorite was the fire-breathing dragons, which he chose to wear when he finished with his shower and dressed for breakfast. He just hoped she didn't ask to have him model them for her. The very last gift came with a note in a very tidy scrawl. Your father left this in my possession before he died. I think it is long past time that it was given to you, as I'm sure he would have wanted. 
Harry opened the package to find a very beautiful cloth that looked like woven liquid. He pulled it out of the box it had come in and found that it was a cloak. But not like any cloak he'd ever seen before. He wrapped it around his shoulders and nearly fell over when he saw his body disappear. At once he knew what it was. He'd heard about this very cloak many times over the years. Sirius often mentioned it when he spoke about pranks he and Harry's father had committed. It was the infamous invisibility cloak. Harry couldn't wait to tell Sirius about its return, much less the chance to try it out. Immediately, Harry began to imagine the places he and Mark might go. And how their adventures would reach a new level of excitement with this in their arsenal. He was broken out of his thoughts and plans when his stomach gave a very audible grumble. Harry practically ran to the Great Hall with his photo album clutched in his hand. He arrived at the same time as the Ravenclaw fourth years, and he hugged Mandy and thanked her for the runes book. She smiled and held up her wrist to show she was wearing the silver charm bracelet he'd gotten her. What's that? She asked noticing the book he held. Come sit with me and you'll see. He smiled. The shy brunette waved to her friends and headed over to the Hufflepuff table, where most of Harry's friends were gathering. Hermione rushed over to him and hugged him tightly, thanking him over and over again for the two books on Salem Academy he'd gotten her. Calm down, Hermione. I just thought you'd like to read about another school. You're always talking about Hogwarts, a history. I thought it would make a nice change of pace. I can't wait to read them both. She squealed in delight. Neville patted his shoulder and thanked him for the wand holster and showed that he was wearing it now. Others came by to thank him for his thoughtful gifts and Harry, with Mandy at his side, sat with the Hufflepuffs to enjoy breakfast. Where Harry started passing around the photo album so his new friends could see pictures of his old friends. Most of the boys had similar reactions of lust to Stacy and Jennifer. While most of the girls swooned over Mark. Harry decided never to tell his friend about this, or he might find it difficult to get into his room with Mark and his ego. There was a small amount of chortles when Harry called Tracy Davis over to let her know about her growing contingent of fans at Salem Academy. Tracy simply smiled and told them all that they needed to fall in line with the obviously intelligent masses at Salem Academy. When breakfast was finished, people began heading off in different directions. Some to more closely inspect their presence, others to study. Actually that had only been Hermione, but Harry guessed that her plans changed when she ran into Victor, who was getting a late start. Harry asked Mandy to take a walk outside with him for a bit. Mandy, smiling bashfully, agreed and had to run up to Ravenclaw Tower to fetch her cloak and gloves. Harry took the time to get his own cloak and put on the new scarf and gloves Stacy had sent him. He met Mandy in the entrance hall and they headed out together into the snow-covered grounds. They headed down to the lake, both feeling incredibly nervous. Have a good Christmas so far. Harry asked. Mandy nodded and brushed some of her breeze-blown hair out of her face. Sure. But, then again, any morning you wake up to a pile of presents is always nice. Good point. Harry nodded and Mandy chuckled softly. Thank you for asking me out for a walk. To be honest, I don't know if I wanted to listen to Sue, Padma, and Lisa talk about their dates for the rest of the day. If I have to hear one more bit of advice from them, I might just pull out all of my hair. That would be an interesting look. Harry smiled, and Mandy shoved him playfully, looking appalled. But her eyes were bright with mirth. We haven't been able to spend much time together since I asked you to be my date. Harry smiled. At least not alone. Not to put any pressure on you, but they seem to think we're going to get married or something. Mandy's blush had nothing to do with the cold. 
I'm curious as to why you're here. I thought you would have gone to see your godfather or something. I would have, but he and my uncle went to London for the day. Harry shrugged. Well, their loss is my gain. I suppose. Mandy smiled and Harry felt himself get warm. They spent the next couple of hours simply strolling the grounds. As they got cold they walked closer together. Mandy eventually linked her arm with Harry's as they made their way around the grounds. They were beginning to head back towards the main entrance of the school when Mandy was hit in the head by a snowball. She gasped in surprise and quickly wiped the excess snow of her face. Harry looked for the assailant but couldn't figure out who exactly had thrown the projectile, as they had unwittingly walked right into a wild snowball fight. Mandy, angry about being hit, gathered up a large handful of snow, shaped it haphazardly and threw it at the closest person, missing them badly. Wow, Harry smirked, that was rather pathetic. Oh. Shut up. Mandy rolled her eyes. Another white missile whizzed past them, narrowly missing Harry. So far as he was concerned, it was a formal declaration of war. Mandy laughed as Harry scooped up some snow, formed it into a near perfect sphere, and threw it hard. Hitting Dean Thomas right in the side of the head. I'm getting out of here before I get hurt. Mandy laughed, quickly running for the safety of the castle. She didn't go in as Hermione, Victor, Susan, and Luna were all sitting close to the castle where they could watch the battle safely. So engrossed was Harry in the fight that he never saw Mandy or many of the other girls slip back into the castle. It wasn't until nearly an hour after he joined in the battle that he caught sight of Neville, who was laughing hysterically at Zachariah Smith who'd just been pelted with a number of snowballs courtesy of Fred and George, masters of banishing their weapons at their prey. Hey. Have you noticed that this has become something of a sausage fest? Harry asked Neville, who looked at him strangely. A hey, what? There's no girls. I was sure Hannah was out here covering you a while ago. Harry pointed out, ducking under one of Fred Weasley's projectiles. She went in to get ready for the ball. A lot of the girls did. Neville smiled right before he got hit right in the face by one of Lee Jordan's weapons. It's still four hours away. Harry exclaimed. Oh. Harry. Fred shouted as he banished another snowball at Harry, who dodged it and returned fire. You know so little of women. No kidding. Harry said rolling out of the way of a bigger boy's volley. So, oh very wise one, please to explain. It takes them much longer than guys because guys don't spend much time on their hair, nor do they wear makeup. George said. He then let out an ear-piercing high-pitched shriek that would have embarrassed little girls, when Lee Jordan snuck up behind him and dumped a handful of snow into the back of his pants. Everyone still out in the freezing winter afternoon who had been a part of the battle fell over clutching their sides in laughter. The snowball fight pretty much ended after that. As George was much more interested in making Lee pay for his crime. Harry and the others began heading back up to the castle when it became too cold outside, and the sun started going down. He knew the ball was supposed to start with dinner, and he was already very hungry. He went to his room to begin getting ready, waving to the others who were all heading in different directions to do the same. After a quick shower, Harry attempted to tame his hair into something less porcupineish. His hair had apparently decided to give him a bit of a reprieve as it cooperated to a small extent. Harry then got into his dress robes, which he was very pleased to discover were much more comfortable than he'd hoped. In fact they were only a bit less comfortable than his favorite jeans. Having promised to meet Mandy in the entrance hall at a quarter to seven, Harry gave himself one last long look to make sure he was presentable, tucked his wand into its holster, 
and headed out to meet his date. Harry was suddenly struck by an attack of anxiety. He was just now realizing what a big deal this whole thing was. The entrance hall was already beginning to fill up with students, all dressed smartly in dress robes or exquisite dresses. Well, mostly. Harry saw Ron Weasley in what looked like a bad throw rug. The shirt of his robes was a mess of yellowed ruffles, and he looked incredibly surly. His expression changed to one of embarrassed fear when Aloise Midgen, who was wearing a rather flattering dress for someone of her size, took his arm and lead him towards the front of the queue. Hey. Harry. Neville greeted as he reached the bottom of the stairs. Ginny Weasley had walked down with him, and came to greet Harry as well. Looking good, Nevada. Harry said. Neville smiled and pretended to flick some lint of his shoulder, making Harry laugh. He turned to Ginny and smiled. You look amazing. Ginny was wearing a shimmering pale green dress, with her fiery red hair pulled back into a simple braid. Thank you, Harry, but you're a bit too late. I have a date. She grinned. But, you will save me a dance, right? Of course. He smiled. Oh, wow. Neville said, looking over Harry's shoulder. Harry turned to see Hannah, followed by Susan, who was being escorted by Ernie, who looked very nervous. Hannah seemed to flow to Neville, who took her hand and just stared in awe at her appearance. Harry had to admit to himself that he now understood why all the girls had gone to get ready so early. There wasn't a single one of them who wasn't breathtaking. Hannah had given her blonde hair an elegant curl, giving her the look of some movie goddess from the 40s that Harry had seen on TV. Her dress was a bright red, which she had painted her lips to match. I have no words. Neville said softly which made Hannah smile brightly. That's praise enough. She said and allowed herself to be escorted into the line. She takes the praise, but I did all the work. Susan grinned. Her hair was tied in a sophisticated knot showing off her slender neck. A lilac dress accentuated her natural curves, and Harry found it hard to keep from drooling a bit. But she said that she did your hair and stuff in the common room. Ernie said, earning him a small glare from his date. You look fantastic, Susan. Harry smiled. She did in fact look better than fantastic, but Harry was still fervently denying that he felt anything more for Susan than friendship. The truth was, he wanted to punch Ernie and escort Susan himself. That is, until he felt a tap on his shoulder and turned to behold the closest thing to perfection he'd ever seen. Mandy's dress was a strapless powder blue wonder. She wore a pair of silver stroppy heels that put her nearly as tall as Harry. Her shoulder length brown hair was curlier than usual, but left to fall around her cream colored shoulders. I ah, just, just, wow. Harry remarked and Mandy blushed, lowering her eyes. Harry lifted her chin so her could see into her soft brown eyes. He bent forward and kissed her lips ever so softly, making her blush a bit more. You really do look like a vision. Harry smiled. Thank you. She said staring into his green orbs. Mr. Potter. Called Professor McGonagall. Mr. Potter, over here, if you please. No, no, Miss Brocklehurst, you as well. Harry and Mandy walked over to the deputy headmistress and found that she had herded all the champions and their dates together. Harry greeted Cedric and Cho, Victor, and Hermione, who had undergone a near impossible transformation, and he even tried to compliment Fleur who gave a polite smile, but said nothing to him. Cedric gave a soft shrug, while Crumb looked at her with disdain. Clearly, he thought the French girl was being immensely rude. The doors to the Great Hall opened and students began filling inside. 
Harry turned to head in with the others when Professor McGonagall stopped him. No, Mr. Potter. The champions will make their entrance when the rest of the students are seated. You will all be sitting at the head table with the judges. She informed them all. When dinner is finished, you will take to the dance floor, and officially open the ball with the first dance. Wait, we have to dance in front of everyone. Harry asked. A bit of panic in his voice. Yes. McGonagall said looking at him intently. Oh gods, Harry, you do know how to dance don't you? Cedric asked, afraid for his young friend. Yeah. One of my friends is a girl, and Sirius thought it would be good if we both learned, but I've never danced with hundreds of people watching me. Harry said, breathing a bit hard. Mandy gave his hand a squeeze. I'm sure you'll do just fine. She said softly, and Harry got himself under control. Okay, Miss Delacour, Mr. Davies, you first. McGonagall said. Ushering Fleur and her date into the hall, followed by Cedric and Cho, Victor and Hermione, and finally. Harry and Mandy. The hall burst with applause as the four champions and their dates entered what to Harry looked like the inside of a crystal cavern. Gone were the four host tables, replaced by dozens of smaller round tables with room for about 20 students each. Harry followed the other champions up to the head table, where Dumbledore, Madame Maxime, Karkaroff, Ludo Bagman, and a wiry-looking red-headed boy with horn-rimmed glasses stood applauding. Harry and Mandy took seats next to the red-headed boy, who introduced himself as Percy Weasley. Mr. Crouch's personal assistant. Harry held out Mandy's seat as he'd seen done in an old movie he'd once seen, and Mandy thanked him. He then took his seat next to her, and saw the menu sitting upon the empty plate in front of him. Before he could ask Mandy what it was about, Dumbledore spoke very clearly. Pork chops. The menu faded into nothingness and Harry saw his plate fill with a sumptuous-looking meal. I guess that's how it's done. Mandy smirked. And Harry suddenly realized that she had been just as confused as he had been. They shared a smile, and both chose the chicken pasta. Harry was unable to talk with Mandy, as Percy Weasley kept up a very steady stream of one sided conversation, and Harry, not wishing to be rude, was forced to listen to Percy go on about what a great job the ministry seemed to be doing with the tournament thus far. Harry really wanted to point out that it wasn't doing that great a job. His mere presence there was proof of it, but Percy never gave him an opportunity to retort. Percy went on talking about how much he did for his boss, Barty Crouch, who was unable to attend the ball due to illness, and how he, Percy, might actually have to take his boss place as a judge for the next task, if Mr. Crouch's condition did not improve. Harry was actually quite thankful when dinner was over. And Dumbledore stood to announce that it was time for the first dance. He along with the other judges, and Percy stepped off the platform that held the head table, followed by the champions, who all took up position on the dance floor with their dates. Dumbledore vanished the head table, where it was replaced by a group of musicians. Oh my gods, he really did get the weird sisters. Mandy exclaimed softly. They're amazing. Harry smiled at Mandy's uncharacteristic excitement, and took her hand, placing his left hand around her waist. He smiled to himself when she closed the gap between them, and gave the barest of smiles as she looked into his eyes once again. It's just us out here, no one else. She whispered. Harry knew she was trying to reassure herself as much as she was him. He could feel her shaking in his arms and knew she was likely far more nervous than he was now that the moment had come. The music started, and the four champions began to dance with their dates. Harry promised to thank Sirius for making him go to those stupid dance lessons the next time he saw his godfather. 
He managed not to step on Mandy's toes, and after a few moments, he believed that there was no one else, save the two of them. It wasn't long before the champions were joined by others. Dumbledore led Professor McGonagall onto the floor and began to lead her around the floor. Hagrid and Madame Maxine cut an elegant rug, which surprised many of the onlookers. Even Snape took to the dance floor with Madame Pants. Something's happened to him. Mandy said, nodding towards the potions master, who looked as if he were trying to fight off a smile. I don't know what's going on, but I'm not the only one to notice. He's. It's like he's someone else. How do you mean? Harry asked. He's been actually explaining things in class, and I heard he actually helped someone. Mandy gave Harry a bewildered look. We all think you did something to him. Oh, no. Harry shook his head, smiling. Don't go putting your weird professor's strangeness on me. I'm just telling you. She shrugged. Well, people change. Maybe he's had an epiphany or something. Harry said taking Mandy's hand and spinning her, making her laugh. The song ended and when the next one began, Dumbledore urged the rest of the students to take to the floor. The song was much faster, and apparently one of the Weird Sisters' bigger hits. Girls shrieked and pulled their dates onto the floor, and Harry and Mandy joined the crowd in dancing. At one point, Harry had to pull Mandy out of the path of Fred Weasley and Alicia Spinett who were dancing so wildly, they were frightening everyone. Harry remarked to Mandy that he wouldn't have been surprised if Fred and Alicia ended up in the hospital wing having thrown their backs out. Harry and Mandy danced together for another three songs. Before Hermione and Victor came up next to them. Would you mind terribly if I dance with Harry? Hermione smiled. I'll lend you Victor. Mandy snickered and nodded her approval. Victor smiled and bowed, offering his hand to Mandy who gave him the cutest curtsy and took his proffered hand. Harry couldn't help but grin as Victor twirled Mandy into the crowd. Having a good time. Hermione asked as they began dancing. I really am. Harry nodded. How about you? This is so much fun. Hermione's smile was so bright. Harry almost had to shield his eyes. Victor knew I wanted to dance with you, so he suggested that I do it now, so he could have my undivided attention the rest of the night. You like him, don't you? It wasn't really a question. And Harry smiled when he saw her eyes get a dreamy sort of look. He's a good guy. That he is. Hermione agreed. What about you and Mandy? We're having fun. Today was the first day we've actually had where no one bothered us. How do you feel about her? Hermione queried. I don't know yet. Harry answered honestly. Well, when you figure it out. Don't fight it. All right. Harry nodded, and the song ended. Harry and Hermione turned to look for their dates, but before they could take a step, Hannah tapped on Harry's shoulder. Neville had to use the bathroom. And I told him I was going to get my dance with you. She smiled. Oh go on, I'll let Mandy know you'll come and find her when you're done. Hermione assured him. Harry smiled his thanks, and took Hannah's hand. Hermione had unwittingly started the trend. It seemed every girl whom he'd promised dances to came to collect. Even girls that Harry hadn't ever spoken to had asked him to dance. Hannah was followed by Ginny, who was followed by Katie Bell. Marietta Edgecombe, Cho, Gabrielle, Megan Jones, Sully, Sally Ann, Alicia Spinett, Angelina Johnson, Parvati Patil, Padma Patil, Lisa Turpin, Morag McDougall, Daphne Greengrass, Tracy Davis. A third-year girl with very curly blonde hair, 
a couple of fifth year girls who both claim to belong to Slytherin House. Finally, when Harry finished his very slow dance with Lavender Brown that involved her rubbing her very impressive body against his, which left Harry rather breathless, he decided he needed to get back to Mandy. He should have done it a while ago, but hadn't wanted to appear rude. Still, he felt very bad now. He'd asked Mandy to the dance, and he knew he should have spent much more time with her. Harry looked everywhere for Mandy. Near the refreshments, at every table, the entrance hall, even the grotto that had been set up for students to get a bit of fresh air. She was nowhere to be seen. Idiot. Harry cursed himself. He imagined that Mandy likely got sick of waiting on him. He hoped that she was just dancing with one of her friends or something, but she didn't appear to be in the Great Hall at all. Harry then got a bright idea. He ran to his room to fetch the Marauder's map. That would make it very easy to find Mandy, so he could beg forgiveness, and he could somehow salvage the evening. Spending the rest of the ball making her feel like she was the center of the universe. But when he got the map, and activated it, she wasn't in the Great Hall or any of the nearby bathroom. In fact, she was in Ravenclaw Tower, in her room. Harry's heart fell. He had screwed up big time. Idiot. Harry shouted as he slumped on his sofa. He banged his hands on his forehead repeating over and over, Stupid. 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 Harry sighed heavily. He thought for just a moment of donning his new invisibility cloak and sneaking into Ravenclaw Tower, until he realized that he had no idea what the password might be. So, the only thing he could do was wait until tomorrow and fall on his knees and beg her forgiveness. Harry was ashamed of himself. He had gotten so caught up in his popularity, and the fact that nearly every pretty girl wanted to dance with him that he'd lost his head entirely. There was no excuse for it. He just hoped that Mandy would allow him to make up for his mistake. Rising from the sofa, Harry removed his tie. There was no sense in returning to the ball now. Without his date, he didn't see the point, and he didn't want to give the impression that he didn't care about Mandy. Harry bent over to pick up the map and put it away when something caught his eye. There apparently dancing with Professor McGonagall was Bartimaeus Crouch. He stared at the little spinning couple oddly. Harry remembered that pompous kid, Percy Weasley saying that Barty Crouch had been at home, sick. Yet, there he was in the Great Hall. Forgetting that he had planned to go to bed, Harry, map in hand, headed back to the Great Hall. He stopped at the Great Oak doors and stared into the crowds, looking for someone he hadn't seen before. Glancing again at the map in his hands, he spotted the Crouch's name again, this time over near the refreshment tables. Harry turned at once to look. But he only saw Professor Moody talking with two sixth-year boys, who were laughing. Potter. Harry turned to see Professor Snape standing behind him. Why are you not dancing? That's a long story but suffice to say I owe my date a huge apology. I kind of let my popularity get the best of me. Harry admitted sadly, turning back to the map, and looking back up towards Moody. Seems rather out of character for you. Snape said. And Harry noted the lack of a condescending tone. Maybe. Harry shrugged. What has your interest? Snape asked looking at Harry with interest. I'm not sure. Either Professor Moody, or Bartimaeus Crouch. Harry said with confusion. Excuse me. Snape asked, looking over Harry's shoulder. Harry pointed to the name on the map and then looked up at Moody who was now speaking to Hagrid. What is this? Snape asked, pulling the map out of Harry's hands. It's a map of the school. My godfather gave it to me. 
Harry said, not even realizing what he was saying. He was so confused by what was going on that he could only stare at Moody. Stay right here, Potter. I mean it. Snape said firmly, slipping into the Great Hall with Harry's map. Harry just nodded, watching Snape go, and turning back to watch Moody. Harry, what are you doing out here? Susan Bones said, coming down the stairs. He guessed she was coming back from the bathroom. I'm not sure. Harry said, not even looking at her. She sidled up next to him and looked into the great hall. Where's Mandy? Susan asked noticing he was alone. In her dorm. Harry said simply, still not looking at Susan. You screwed up. Didn't you? Harry turned now, looking at Susan who was looking at him with sympathy. He could only nod. Yeah. Was all he said dot before he could say anything more there came a chorus of screams. Harry and Susan turned to see that the music had stopped and Moody was holding a seventh-year girl close to him, his wand at her neck. Try anything. And I swear she'll be dead before she hits the floor, and I'll make sure it hurts. Moody snarled. I don't know how you figured it out, but I will not be caught by the likes of you, Dumbledore. You have no hope of escape. Dumbledore said calmly. Though Harry heard that the old headmaster's tone was laced with venom. The only way you'll take me is through this stunning beauty. Moody snapped. He then gave a long sniff of his whimpering hostage. Her fear is intoxicating. Will you be responsible for her death, Dumbledore? Will you sacrifice her young life in order to get your hands on me? Moody was slowly backing out of the Great Hall, getting closer to Harry and Susan. Harry began to slip his wand out of his holster, while slowly guiding Susan out of the way of the defense professor. Harry began to raise his wand, thinking he might be able to stop the teacher, but Harry had forgotten about Moody's magical eye. Don't even think about it Potter. No one gets in my way and this pretty little flower lives to see Boxing Day. Moody shouted as he dragged the now sobbing girl along with him. He held her tightly by the throat, his wand pressed deeply into her flesh. I mean it. Harry saw the man dig the tip of his wand a bit deeper into the girl's neck, making her cry out. Moody was now passing by Harry and Susan, who was shaking next to Harry, hands covering her mouth in horror and her eyes shining with tears. Moody turned to look at Harry and gave him a predatory smile. Harry felt the hair on the back of his neck stand on end, and he fought against a chill. Harry saw all the teachers of Hogwarts, wands raised at Moody who was grinning evilly now. Snape gave Harry a pointed look that Harry knew meant that he should stay right where he was. Harry didn't feel the need to argue. He was terribly confused but he knew he wouldn't stand a chance against a former Auror like Moody. Slowly Moody slipped out of the castle, the teachers following him at a distance. As every time they got to close for his liking, he would remind them of his hostages' frailty in some way. Keeping their distance, many of the students followed behind, Curiosity winning out over common sense. Harry spotted Neville who was clutching hands with Hannah. Harry took hold of Susan's hand and dragged her behind him over towards Neville. What happened? Harry asked. Neville shook his head. Don't know. Hannah and I were dancing and then there was the scream and the music stopped and we all saw Moody grab that girl and start shouting. We saw Professor Snape talking to Professor Dumbledore. Hermione said coming up behind Harry, Neville, and the girls. Victor was right behind her, holding her hand. He looked upset and was showing Dumbledore a piece of parchment. They then went to talk to Moody and Moody just grabbed that girl, and Hermione left the rest unspoken. Harry began following the rest of the students out of the castle, with his friends behind him. 
hoping to see what might happen next. Unfortunately, they were too far away. All they saw was a bright red blast, several screams and then, nothing until a very angry looking Professor Dumbledore and the rest of the teachers came back up to the courtyard and told all the students that the ball was over and they were all to return to their dormitories. Harry saw that the girl was safe, wrapped in Professor McGonagall's arms, who was whispering to the girl, likely assuring her that she was indeed safe now. Harry saw Snape looking at him. And Harry gave him a questioning look, but Snape gave the smallest shake of his head. Harry made a mental note to seek out the potions master the next day as he turned to do as the headmaster had ordered. It was a long time before Harry could even think of falling asleep. He was desperately confused. What exactly had happened? Who had that person been? Was it Professor Moody, or Bartimaeus Crouch? Why had he taken a hostage, Harry was now convinced of one thing. Whoever it had been, Harry was sure that they were part of the conspiracy that had led to Harry being at Hogwarts now. The fire was low, and the man was knelt before a high backed chair. His head bowed so low that none of his face was exposed to the soft light. A second person stood in shadows, head bowed as well. I thought it only a matter of time until your charade was exposed. A cruel voice spoke from the chair. Though I had hoped that you would be able to maintain it until the end of the tournament. Forgive me my lord the kneeling man begged. I know not how the old fool learned it of my disguise. I knew I had to escape or they would force me to take Veritas serum, and I had no desire to bend to their will and betray you. Very wise. It would be most unfortunate if I had to kill you. As it stands, right now you are the only one I can count on. The man in the corner shifted, but remained silent. We will have to shift our plans. I will not be denied my return. The voice said softly, nearly gasping in exasperation. Still, I am quite disappointed. You passed right by Potter. You could have grabbed him and brought him here before me. You should have taken him. For that, you must be punished. Crucio. Harry fell out of his bed, landing heavily on the floor. His scar felt as if there were a thousand white hot knives being stabbed into it. Harry scrambled into the bathroom where he promptly vomited up his dinner, and he was sure, most of his breakfast. Dot gasping for breath. Harry rolled onto his back when he'd emptied his stomach and stared up at the ceiling of his bathroom. His heart was pounding and his skin felt as frozen as the grounds outside the castle. When his breathing was normal once again, and his heart rate steadied, Harry picked himself up off the floor. Sirius and Remus had been adamant in their instructions to him should something like this happen again. They stressed that this sort of thing could be of great importance. So Harry didn't even pause to put on a dressing robe or shoes. He strode out of his room and headed straight for the headmaster's office to tell Dumbledore all that he had just dreamed. Harry awoke the morning after the Yule Ball feeling far more exhausted than before he'd gone to sleep the second time the previous night. He had gone to see Dumbledore around midnight after awaking from such a horrible dream. Harry had been surprised that the Hogwarts headmaster had been awake at such a late hour. Dumbledore though clearly still upset over the events of the evening, had invited Harry into the office. Harry was then introduced to Fox the Phoenix, who, having sensed Harry's fear and worry, alighted upon the boy's shoulder, trilling in Harry's ear, calming him at once. Fox stayed on the boy's shoulder as he told the headmaster all about the dream of what he now knew to be Lord Voldemort and his two followers, whom he'd had been unable to identify. When Harry had finished, Dumbledore thanked him, and assured Harry that everything was now in hand, and also thanked him for helping discover the imposter. The boy wasn't sure why, but for some reason, he didn't believe Dumbledore's assurances. 
Harry had a lot of trouble getting back to sleep when he returned to his room. His mind simply would not shut down. Between the dream, the moody imposter, and his royal screw-up with Mandy, Harry felt completely lost. Dragging himself out of bed, Harry decided to get in a run before breakfast. He and the other boys had agreed to take a bit of time off, but right now, Harry couldn't think of anything better to do, and he usually did his best thinking while running. The sky was a bright steel grey, and there was a strong wind blowing from the north. Harry felt himself begin to shiver as he stepped out of the castle and down to the pitch. He had only one thing he needed an answer to. How to apologize to Mandy. She hadn't said it, but the ball had been important to her, and they'd been having a really good time. Harry remembered how softly she'd smiled at him when they had met in the entrance hall. She had looked like some beautiful princess out of a muggle movie, and Harry remembered how his heart had fluttered when he'd kissed her. And then, he'd mucked it all up. Harry hated to imagine how she must have looked when she left the Great Hall. He felt a pain in his chest as he pictured her crying as she ran all the way back to Ravenclaw Tower. At the very least, he should have alternated dances with those girls and Mandy. She might have been understanding. If he were really honest with himself, he should have just said no to those girls and spent his evening with Mandy. Harry ran until he could barely stand, and finally allowed himself to crumple onto a set of stairs leading up into the Quidditch stands, gasping for breath. He had never been so angry with himself. He was usually more conscientious of other people's feelings. Then again, he'd never been this popular before. Once again, Harry wished he were back at Salem with Mark and Stacy. Then again, he might have screwed up with Stacy already and he'd still be miserable. His faith in himself as a person was taking a real beating today. Harry checked his watch and, with a sigh, pulled himself up and headed back into the castle to shower, change, and throw himself on Mandy's mercy. His deepest hope was that she would allow him to speak to her. When Harry got to the Great Hall, he went right to the Ravenclaw table to look for the shy brunette, only to see she was not there. He did find Mandy's friends, though. He was actually surprised to see them glaring at him as he approached. Do you know where Mandy is? He asked. Sully answered before any of the others could. She stared at him as if he were something atrocious and Harry noticed the other girls giving him similar looks of disgust. Probably still crying her poor eyes out. The Asian girl snapped. How could you ignore her like that? I didn't mean to ignore her. Harry replied, a bit irritated. I just got caught up in everything, and... Look, I screwed up and I want to make it up to her. You don't deserve her, Potter. Lisa Turpin snarled. She's an incredibly sweet girl and you're a pompous jerk. It's not cool to play with people's hearts like that, Potter. Padmapadil chastised. Hey. Harry snapped, losing his temper and glaring at all the Ravenclaw girls now. I seem to recall that each of you asked me to dance. Don't try and put it all on me. I screwed up, yes. But I'm not entirely to blame. Just go away, and leave Mandy alone. Morag shouted, causing quite a few people to turn and stare. Harry went to the Hufflepuff table and sat down in a huff. Susan looked up and gave him a sympathetic smile. I'm sorry, Harry. She said patting his shoulder. For what? You didn't do anything wrong. Harry said sulkily. Maybe, maybe not. Who's to say? 
but I still feel bad for my part. She said softly, pouring him a glass of orange juice. She'd noticed he preferred that to pumpkin juice in the morning. Harry took the goblet and gave her a half nod of thanks. Susan just smiled and returned to her muffin and fruit. They found the real Moody. Justin and Ernie all but shouted as they joined Harry and Susan at the table. We saw him in the hospital wing, and we overheard Flitwick telling Sinister they found him in a trunk in the defense office. Justin explained. What were you two doing in the hospital wing? Susan asked. Let's just say that we aren't ready to shave just yet. Justin smiled, his cheeks coloring slightly. Forget that. Ernie said quickly before any more questions could be asked. What do you suppose Moody was doing locked in his own trunk, and who was that last night? If he was being kept alive, that means the imposter was likely using polyjuice potion. So that means it was Barty Crouch, but I'm still confused. Harry said mostly to himself. How do you know it was Barty Crouch? Susan asked, her own curiosity piqued. I have this map that... The map. Harry sat up suddenly. He looked up at the head table, and then got up from his seat. I'll see you guys later. He said and dashed out of the great hall, leaving a very confused group of Hufflepuffs behind him. He nearly sprinted into the dungeons to Snape's office, where he stopped to catch his breath before knocking on the door. Come. Came the response. Harry opened the door and Snape raised his head from whatever he'd been doing. A.H.H., Potter, I've been expecting you. You no doubt wish to have your map returned to you. If I could, Sir Harry said hopefully. I am afraid I cannot do that. The headmaster now has it in his possession. He's very interested in it, and I think your godfather will have more than a few questions to answer when next they meet. Sit down, Potter. Harry took a seat in front of Snape's desk, feeling more depressed now that he'd learned that his map had been taken. It was one of a very few thing he owned that had been his father's. You didn't look happy when we spoke last night. You mentioned that you had messed things up with your date. Would you like to speak about this? Harry's mouth fell open in shock. He could only stare at the professor for a long moment before his brain began to re-engage. Not that I'm not thankful for your concern, sir, but I was under the impression that you strongly disliked me. Harry said. Snape now looked slightly ashamed and sat back in his own seat, folding his arms, and avoiding Harry's eye. Harry thought that Snape might get defensive or angry, but instead, the potions master simply sighed before speaking. It was never you I disliked, Harry. He said, startling the boy with the use of his first name. It's more what you represent. And to be honest with you, it's more my perception of that. I've spent my entire life blaming others for my mistakes. It has only been recently that I have become a bit more, shall we say, introspective. In fact, I think if it were not for your arrival here, I may have continued on my path, and I am sure it would have been my end. I am taking your advice and trying to be the man my friend Lily Evans would have been proud to know. Good for you, Sir Harry smiled. I think that just the fact that you're trying would make her happy. Thank you, but I think that's enough about me. Tell me what happened. Harry went into the tale about how the ball had been going great, and how Hermione had asked him for a dance. Harry stressed that Hermione was only a friend and that Mandy had danced with Victor Crumb during the song. But then, when the song was over, 
a seemingly never-ending stream of girls were all but lined up for a turn around the dance floor with him. He ashamedly told Snape how his ego, and likely his hormones, had overruled his mind, and he danced with every girl who asked him. I didn't really forget about Mandy, I just lost track of everything. I've never had so many girls interested in me before. I mean, back home, I'm just James, a decent student who plays Quidditch and races. I'm no one special. But here, I'm worshipped. I've tried not to let it get the best of me, but last night. It was too much. Snape offered and Harry nodded guiltily. All I want to do right now is find Mandy and try and make this right. You know, beg for forgiveness or something. I knew better, and I screwed up. I can't even imagine how angry she must be. Harry said sadly. May I suggest something? Snape asked, leaning forward once again. Harry looked up and nodded. This worked for me once, with your mother, in fact. Go up to Ravenclaw Tower and stand in front of the door. Do not move, and let everyone know who passes you that you intend to stay there as long as it takes until she speaks to you. While I admit to not having ever managed to understand the mind of the female of our species, I do know that she will come out to speak to you, if only to make you go away. You can tell her what you need to tell her, but after that, you must abide her wishes, do you understand? If she doesn't want to be my friend anymore, I have to leave her alone. Harry said glumly. Indeed. You're smarter than your father, at least. Harry gave a hint of a glare at the potions master, who ignored it. Clearly. Snape would never get past what Harry's father had put him through as a child, but he was very obviously trying to be a better man himself. They fell into silence for a few moments before Harry spoke up again. Sir, why didn't any of you stun that imposter last night? Snape scowled and sat back in his seat once again. Were it up to me, I would have. He said sharply. I would have stunned the girl, taking away his shield and then stunned him, and we might actually have some answers. But the headmaster feels very differently. Though, I am sure he is second-guessing his actions. He is very wise, Dumbledore, but he sometimes misses the details when he looks at the big picture. I'm in much more danger than I've been led to believe, aren't I? Harry asked, and Snape could only look at him. Harry swore he saw the twinge of regret on the sallow face of the man before him. We are all doing what we can to protect you. Snape finally said. But, you are not helpless. Continue training, focus on the tournament. If you need help, while I can't officially assist you. I can at least point you in the right direction. Thank you, Sir Harry smiled, and Snape waved towards the door. Go and fix your mistake, Potter. Harry decided that Snape's advice had merit and decided to try it. He desperately wanted to talk to Mandy, so he would have tried anything. Without the map, though, Harry had trouble remembering where Ravenclaw Tower was, or even if Mandy was still there. Eventually, he decided to follow a few Ravenclaw first years back up to Ravenclaw Tower, and told them to let Mandy know he was outside waiting to speak to her. Harry had expected to wait for hours for her to emerge, and was shocked therefore when she appeared only a few seconds later. She looked truly miserable hair matted and unbrushed, eyes red and puffy as if she'd been crying a lot. She looked at him with something that looked between total disdain and longing. Harry's heart sank further, and his throat constricted tightly. 
I have to say, I'm a bit surprised you remember my name. She said coldly. Harry flinched at her cool tone, and he took a deep breath trying to get his mouth to work properly. I'm really sorry. He said after a few moments. I have no excuse, and even if I did, it wouldn't be good enough to forgive what I did. I should have spent the night with you, or at the very least came to dance with you between. No, I should have just refused them, and spent my time with you. You were the one I asked to the ball. I'm really sorry. Honestly, I never had any illusions about what might happen. Mandy said, her voice dropping in volume as she spoke, her eyes glistening with tears. I knew I would have to share you. Every girl in this school wanted to be you date, even if they said they didn't. But you asked me, and for the life of me, I don't know why you did it. I asked you because you were the only girl who didn't bring it up whenever we talked. I asked you because I think you're sweet and fun and I thought we would have had a good time. And we were, until I let my ego get the better of me. My friends kept coming up to me and asking me why we weren't dancing together, you know. Mandy looked up, wiping at her eyes. Then, the hypocrites would dance with you. It was like I was fate's punching bag last night. I felt so stupid. I came looking for you. Harry tried. I was too late, but I did. I never meant to treat you so bad. I had every intention of making the night something special for you. For both of us. I just... I just want to make it up to you somehow. I want to show you that you are a special. I don't think you can do that, Harry. Mandy said, starting to shake now, her voice getting thick as she fought against her tears. I got it in my head that you liked me. That you thought I was special. That Harry Potter preferred the quiet, shy wallflower over the vapid, airhead girls with the huge boobs. My friends didn't help, either. They kept telling me that it was meant to be, and I let myself fall for it all. But then you just forgot about me like I was nothing. You broke my heart last night. Harry felt like he was going to be sick. He knew that he must have hurt her, he'd never had any doubt of that. But seeing her now, listening to her, he knew that he'd truly underestimated his pal up. I'm so sorry. He said weakly. I want you to go away, Harry. She said softly, tears streaming from her eyes now. I want you to go away and leave me alone. You blew it. With that, she went back into the Ravenclaw common room, leaving a very dejected and heartbroken Harry to slouch against the wall. She doesn't mean it, you know. Luna Lovegood said, coming close and sitting next to Harry, her dreamy smile soft and a little sad. She's just upset. I hurt her, Luna. Harry sighed, his hands rubbing his stinging eyes. Even if I could make things right between us, I would never deserve someone like Mandy. Perhaps. Luna said. The truth is, a relationship with you and Mandy would have ended far worse. You are far too different to ever be compatible. While I can understand your attraction to her, and I'm sure the beginning of your relationship would have been filled with all sorts of debaucherous and exciting trysts, eventually. When your hormones had gotten enough, I don't think the two of you would have had much common ground. How can you know that? Harry asked and Luna smiled. I see things. I hear things. She said conspiratorially. I know that Mandy hates Quidditch. She only goes to matches because she hates being alone. 
she is an only child, and she had no friends before Hogwarts, because she's so shy. Her friends have tried to get her out of her shell, but she's most comfortable when she's not being noticed. You would come to resent her for not wanting to stand out with you. I don't think. Harry began but Luna ignored him and carried on. You need someone who is confident in themselves. Someone who will support you in everything you attempt and cheer you on the whole way. Even if it's something stupid. A girl who can stand on her own without your support, but desires it just the same. A woman who is strong in mind and body, but loves being feminine. Are you talking about yourself here, Luna? Harry asked, with a slight smile. Luna gave a slight shrug of her shoulders. Perhaps, but I've already told you where my heart is. No, I was thinking someone like Hermione Granger, or Hannah Abbott. Pansy Parkinson might make a good choice if she weren't so bitter. Daphne Greengrass would make a very interesting match, but I think you would have a difficult time courting her. There is also Katie Bell. I've noticed that French girl who keeps talking to you has a very interesting aura about her. Most boys look as if they've been smacked with a hooping fish whenever she passes by. It's worse with her older sister, but you always seem unaffected by it. Harry laughed at the mental picture of Gabrielle smacking boys in the face with a large fish. Sully would also be a good choice for you. But Sue's Mandy's friend, and I just... Of course I didn't mean right this second. Luna smiled. You need time to reflect on how things with Mandy went wrong so you don't repeat your mistake with the right girl. You're really amazing, Luna. Harry said. Luna gave him her signature faraway smile, and he bent forward and kissed her cheek. I am truly honored to call you my friend. I know. Luna grinned, getting to her feet. She waved at Harry and left him. Harry got to his feet and headed back to his own room, where he spent the rest of the day reflecting on all that had happened. His guilt and heartache over the pain he'd cause Mandy didn't go away, even three weeks later. Every time he saw her in class or the Great Hall, his heart felt as if it were being stabbed. Luna's words rang in his head constantly, telling him it wouldn't have worked anyway, but Harry felt that they should have been allowed to figure it out on their own. Sirius managed to help him break through his growing depression when they visited next. It's good that you feel guilty, and that you want to make amends, and maybe one day you will, but for now, you need to forgive yourself, and move on. Take away the lesson you've learned from this and move forward. I'm trying. Harry sighed. I just can't. I just want to keep apologizing. Harry, you're young, and you're going to mess up from time to time. It's how you become a better person. You learn from your mistakes, and you use that knowledge in the future. This is no different. I'm sure Mandy is a very nice girl, but she's right. You did blow it. Sirius said, clapping a hand to Harry's shoulder. But, she's not the only one. The next girl you fancy, you won't make the mistake of ignoring, or forgetting. But don't go to the other extreme. I just wish I could forget it all. Do you think I could get a time turner and do it all over? Harry asked and Sirius barked with laughter. Then you might have a whole new set of problems. Sirius chuckled. Give yourself time. Hang out with your friends. Train for the next task. In time, it will get better. I promise. Harry had faith in his godfather, and if Sirius said it would get better, then who was he to argue? 
Harry took serious advice. He worked very hard in the month leading up to the second task. As promised, Harry got three doses of gillyweed. He tested the first early on a Saturday morning. He went out to the Black Lake, and as per the instructions, ate the rubbery plant as he headed into the water. Harry then spent a glorious, wondrous hour exploring the depths of the Black Lake. It was the strangest sensation breathing water like a fish, but he really enjoyed that his eyes adjusted to the deep, and he was able to see quite clearly. Although everything was tinted a eerie green. He discovered that the lake was teeming with grindy lows. Harry spent ten minutes fighting off the little water demons. As they were everywhere, Harry knew he'd have no hope in avoiding them in the task. That didn't matter to Harry, though, as he was able to send boiling streams of water at the creatures which made them run away. The lake was so vast that Harry was unable to figure out where the mermaid village was on his first try. He also failed on his second attempt to pinpoint its location. However, he knew that it must lie in the last third of the lake that he hadn't managed to get to, and as he only had one dose left of gillyweed, Harry knew he was already a step up above the others. At least, he thought so. Harry had seen Crumb emerging from the lake several times in the last two weeks before the task, each time they would smile and wave at each other. Harry guessed that Crumb was practicing whatever method he'd chosen, and was also trying to become more familiar with the lake. The three male champions hardly spoke of the upcoming task while they ran each morning, or when they practiced spell work every other evening after dinner. While they had all figured out what they were supposed to do for the second task, they were still confused by the bit about looking for something they would miss. Harry sometimes wondered how Fleur was preparing for the second task, as he never saw her near the lake. He asked Gabrielle two weeks before the event about her sister's progress. She is training hard, but I have been sworn not to tell anyone, the young French girl rolled her eyes. She is determined to be first. She is very jealous that you and the other two boys are around each other all the time. She thinks you are conspiring against her. Harry began to protest but Gabrielle simply held up her finger to his lips, smiling at her contact. My sister is very stubborn and self-centered. I have already told her that I thought she would be welcome to join you, but she is adamant that you three are against her. Gabrielle laughed, and Harry joined her. Harry's friends did a good job of taking his mind off the debacle of the Yule Ball, as did the real Professor Moody, who the entire school was buzzing about. The real Alastair Moody was a much stricter teacher than the imposter had been, and nearly everyone felt exhausted after one of his practical lessons. The XR seemed determined to undo the damage done by the imposter. Harry had never enjoyed a class more thoroughly than he did Moody's. With the imposter, Harry had found himself being the guinea pig whenever the fake professor wanted to show some new curse, but the real Moody didn't play favorites and there was always a betting pool before class to figure out who the next victim would be. Before anyone had realized it, the second task was upon them. Harry awoke the morning of the second task from a dream wherein he was sitting on the shore of the lake with Susan Bone, Hannah Abbott, and Neville. Harry smiled when he thought of the redhead. She'd been a near-constant companion over the last month. Occasionally they were joined in the library by Neville and Hannah. The two weren't dating as of yet, but Harry was sure it was only a matter of time. Harry rolled out of bed and donned the swimming clothes that had been delivered the night before, and stuffed the bag of gillyweed into his pocket, placed his wand holster on his wrist, and finally grabbed a cloak to keep him warm until he had to jump into the lake. Harry headed up to the Great Hall for breakfast, 
and noticed that Professor Dumbledore was not present. While unusual, it was not unheard of. Harry figured he was taking care of some last-minute details before the task. Harry passed Cedric, who was eating breakfast, and looking rather puzzled. He waved good morning as he passed, and took a seat next to Susan, who smiled up at him. Harry then took a quick glance over at the Ravenclaw table to look for Mandy. Even after all this time, he still felt a pang of sorrow at the mere thought of the shy girl. She wasn't present yet, and Harry turned to his Hufflepuff friends. Good morning, Harry. Neville said cheerily. The round-faced Gryffindor was sitting next to Hannah and buttering a piece of toast. Susan poured his morning goblet of orange juice, as had become her custom. Harry thanked her as he sat down. Ready for the task? Hannah asked as Harry took some toast for himself. Surprisingly, I think I am. You should be. Susan commented. You've studied hard, and I heard Cedric say that you have begun beating him more and more in your duels. He's exaggerating. Harry rolled his eyes. He's still wiping the floor with me. Cedric looks really nervous. Hannah said, looking down the table at the sixth year. Harry also took a gander, but shrugged. He might just be second-guessing himself. Harry suggested. That's odd. Susan said, also looking at the Hufflepuff champion. Cho usually eats breakfast with him. I wonder why she's not there. Maybe he asked her not to, Neville offered. Both Hannah and Susan looked at him as if he were a simpleton. Neville looked between them curiously. What? Oh, Neville, sweetie. There's so much you don't understand about girls. Hannah sighed, patting his cheek. Neville simply nodded and turned back to his cereal. Hannah looked over to Susan, apparently about to say something else when something caught her eye. Before anyone had the chance to wonder about it, someone spoke. So this is where you've been hiding your sorry ass, Black. Came a venomous voice from behind Harry. Everyone turned, and Harry launched out of his seat when he saw the four people standing behind him with huge smiles on their faces. Mark. Harry shouted as he hugged his best friend. Harry and the other boy were laughing so hard, it became rather contagious, and Neville, Susan and Hannah, along with the three teens who accompanied Mark, all smiled brightly. Mark was Harry's height with a very similar build. His hair was a soft chestnut color and very short and wiry. Like Harry, his brown eyes were alight with secret mischief. He, along with the other three teens all wore the uniforms that Harry wore, cocky pants for the boys with blue button-down shirts. The girls wore skirts. All four teens had heavy black cloaks and scarves as well. What are you doing here? When did you get here? Harry asked excitedly. About ten minutes ago, and we're here to cheer on our Salem champion. Mark said stepping aside so Harry could see who had accompanied him. Harry's eyes nearly popped out f his head when he caught sight of the first girl who was with his best friend. Harry felt as if all the air in his lungs had simply vanished. Hi, James. The girl was a few inches shorter than Harry with dark blonde hair past her shoulders. She had a petite, athletic frame and soft brown eyes. She was giving him a soft warm smile and looking a bit shyly at him. Harry stumbled forward, closing the gap and embraced her. Susan turned to Hannah who looked as gobsmacked as she felt as they beheld the reunion. Oh, I've missed you so much. Stacy said softly as he held her. 
I've missed you, too. Harry confessed. Okay, you too. I'm actually starting to feel like I should be jealous or something the second boy said, though there was no hint of malice, or even irritation. Harry turned and hugged the shortest of the four. A dark-haired boy with broad shoulders and a thin nose. How are you, Duncan? Harry smiled. Good. Things have really sucked since you've been gone, though. Duncan smiled. He isn't lying. Stacy said, standing close to Harry. U.M.M., Harry. Hannah said, trying to sound politely. Care to introduce us? Sorry. Harry said, the laughter still clear in his voice. Hannah, Susan, Neville, Harry said pointing to each person. This is Mark, Stacy, Duncan, and Jennifer, who until today, I don't think I've ever talked to. Harry grinned and Jennifer, the tall brunette who was now on Mark's arm simply smiled. I was intimidated by you, too. She grinned and Harry laughed. Come on, sit down, grab something to eat. Harry said, motioning for his old friends to join his new friends. No one told me you guys were coming. Harry said. We weren't told until last night. Or this morning. Mark said, looking confused. Time change is a real bitch, you know that. Anyway. Stacy said, interrupting. Madam Blaylock gathered us up and said that we were coming to Hogwarts to cheer you on, if we wanted. Like any of us were going to say no. I can't believe you're all here. This is so great. Harry exclaimed, looking at Stacy, who had now linked hands with Duncan. Harry knew they were dating, and had been fine with it until now. Perhaps it was the fact that they had been so far away. But now that it was right in front of him, he felt a stab of jealousy. Yeah, Mark agreed. I just wish we would be able to stay longer. We're only here for the day. But you're here, and that's all that matters. Harry grinned. A few more of Harry's friends came by to meet the new arrivals. Harry actually fell out of his seat from laughing so hard when he introduced Duncan and Mark to Tracy Davis. Harry remembered how Mark had written that Tracy had a growing fan club back at Salem, and given the looks of surprised recognition and incoherent speech from his two male friends. Harry wondered if they'd forgotten that Tracy went to Hogwarts. Both Jennifer and Stacy looked very unimpressed by their boyfriend's behavior, but treated Tracy nicely, even apologizing for the boys. Tracy didn't appear offended at all. In fact, she took a seat across from Mark, and began to question him about Harry at length. Mark was all too eager to share stories about his best friend, though Harry interrupted often, preventing many stories from being finished before they even reached the juicy parts. The Hogwarts students were very entertained to simply watch and listen to Harry and his friends, all mesmerized by the scene. A few of the Hufflepuffs tried to interject into the conversation, and while the Salem students were welcoming, and nice, Harry's new friends felt a bit left out. At half past eight, Professor McGonagall came to notify Harry that he was due at the champion's tent. Harry got up with his Salem and Hogwarts friends and headed down to the lake. Along the way, the Salem students marveled at the grounds of the great castle, and even at the castle itself. It was still quite cold, but most all of the winter's snow was gone. Harry and his entourage were met by another two familiar faces. Serious. Harry shouted as he hugged his godfather. How are ya feeling, pup? Sirius smiled. Right now, 
I think I could face a basilisk blindfolded. Harry said turning back to his friends. Well, that's probably the only way to do it. Mark laughed. If you weren't blindfolded it would kill you with its stare, dork. The other teens laughed and Harry nodded and made I knew that face. Good, you all made it? Sirius said. Dumbledore let us know last night that you'd all be arriving today. Why don't you all join us in the stands? Remus offered, motioning to the walkway leading to the spectators' seating. Good luck. Mark said. Hurry it up so we can do something fun. Don't listen to him. Stacy smiled at Harry. He hadn't seen her since October, and she still made him slightly weak in the knees. She grabbed his shoulders and kissed his cheek. Be careful, okay. Good luck, brother. Duncan said, giving Harry a firm handshake. Even Jennifer gave him a hug before leaving Sirius and Harry to enter the tent. I'm very proud of you, and I'm sure your parents would be, too. I know it wasn't your choice to be here, but you've proven beyond any doubt that you should be here. I just wish I hadn't had to in the first place. Harry smirked, and Sirius hugged him again. Do what you have to do, and finish. Don't take any unnecessary risks down there. Hey. Who do you think you're talking to? Harry looked offended, but his eyes were still dancing merrily. Sirius laughed and gave Harry a confident pat on the shoulder, leaving him to finish preparing. The tent was similar to the one he'd waited in before the first task. There were four separate rooms, each with a cot. Harry saw Victor sitting on his cot, looking very grim. Cedric also looked similarly upset. But Fleur looked livid. She was pacing angrily, having already stripped down to her form-fitting bathing suit, which left very little to wonder about her figure. Harry was enthralled by her long slender, very smooth-looking legs. He had to tear his eyes away from the French champion when she looked sharply at him. Harry scurried away to his own cot, shrugging out of his cloak. They weren't there very long before Professor McGonagall entered and asked them all to come outside. Harry followed Cedric, who didn't even look at him. Harry just figured he was concentrating. The four champions walked down a long wooden sort of walkway onto a platform hovering a few feet above the dark, glassy surface of the lake. They lined up at the edge, all staring at the mirror-like surface, awaiting the go-ahead to dive in. Ladies and gentlemen, Luda Bagman's voice could be heard. Last night, something was taken from each of our champions and hidden under the lake. They will have exactly 60 minutes to retrieve it and make it back to the surface. Champions, at the sound of the cannon, you may jump in. Harry took out his gillyweed and stuffed it into his mouth, beginning to chew it slowly, grimacing at its texture. A moment later, there was a thunderclap, and all four of the champions dove artfully into the cold, dark water. Harry thought that the cannon blast hadn't come soon enough. He was already feeling the changes taking effect when it had sounded. But it was all alright now as the plant altered him for his mission. Harry smiled to himself as he kicked out with his now webbed feet, heading towards the part of the lake he had yet to explore. Sirius watched his godson leap into the water, and he let out a sigh of worry. So far as he knew, Harry still had no idea what he had to retrieve, and until the previous evening, neither did Sirius. Sirius and Remus had been away a lot since Christmas, on Dumbledore's request. They had been tasked with reaching out to former members of the Order of the Phoenix, a group that had opposed Lord Voldemort and his Death Eaters in the last war. 
Sirius and Remus had only joined the group in the last two years of the war, along with James, Lily, and their former friend, Peter Pettigrew. They had already convinced the Tonks family to join with Dumbledore, should his worst fears prove real. They had visited other prominent families as well. None of them were willing to believe that the most feared dark wizard of all time could possibly rise from the dead. However, whenever Sirius pointed out that the boy who defeated the Dark Lord was alive, and competing in the Triwizard Tournament, most all of the people they visited relented. They had kept in constant contact with Dumbledore, keeping him up to date with their progress. Every couple of weeks they would return so they could visit with Harry who, except for the incident with the Yule Ball, which was still troubling him even up to their last visit a week ago. Was doing well and working harder than ever. On their first visit back to Hogwarts, Dumbledore had asked them both a myriad of questions regarding the Maruiter's map, which the headmaster informed them had, with Harry's help, uncovered the truth about the person posing as Professor Moody. Dumbledore desperately wished to replicate it to prevent future incidents. Of course, the Marauders offered their assistance, both rather sad that there would likely be less trouble making. That is, until Dumbledore assured them that he only wished to use it to catch anyone who wished the students or teachers real harm. He didn't consider a few students sneaking out of bed to sneak into the kitchens of any real importance. Sirius and Remus had also been keeping their eyes and ears open for any indication of where their former friend was hiding out. So far, there hadn't been a single whisper. But last night, they had been asked to come to Dumbledore's office rather urgently. When they arrived, they found a very bewildered headmaster. The second task is set for tomorrow morning, and we have encountered a rather big problem. He had said after offering them both a drink. Each champion will have to swim to the Mare Village and retrieve something very important to each individual. Specifically, a person who means quite a lot to them. They will be placed in an enchanted sleep that will break once their head breaks the surface of the lake once again. The problem we have is that Harry does not seem to favor any one person over anyone else. It was my hope that he might have mentioned to you if he has a crush, or a close friend. Here at Hogwarts. Sirius asked, and then shook his head. To be honest with you, there are a few. The thing about Harry is he likes everyone equally. It takes a while for him to develop deep bonds, and he just hasn't been here that long. I would suggest using one of his friends from Salem, but... Unfortunately, they will not arrive in time. Dumbledore sighed. Wait, they're coming. Sirius looked surprised. Harry asked me right before the first task if his friends could come and watch. However, it was quite short notice. Headmistress Blaylock and I have been preparing to have four of Harry's friends come for this next one, and they will be arriving about an hour before the start of tomorrow's event. I will personally be going to London to escort them here to the castle. There is no time to make the preparations. It needs to be someone here at Hogwarts. My suggestion would be serious. Remus said. We've all agreed it must be another student. This was agreed upon before the tournament began. I'm afraid there would be serious ramifications if Sirius were used. Headmaster Karkaroff is constantly accusing me of cheating. I do not need anything else to fuel that. Can you think of no one? Dumbledore asked wearily. What about Hermione? Remus asked. He's always talking about her. He thinks very highly of her. Unfortunately, Miss Granger has already been selected for another of the champions. Dumbledore shook his head. What about Mandy? 
Sirius asked. It is my understanding that Harry and Miss Brocklehurst were not speaking. Dumbledore sat up a little bit. That's true, but I know that Harry misses her a lot. He feels that because of his big-headedness, he was cheated out of a chance to see if there was anything between them. Maybe this would help them patch things up enough to resume their friendship. She's refused to speak to him, and it's torn Harry up quite badly. It could. Dumbledore said thoughtfully. Each of the hostages, for lack of a better word, has been told exactly what will happen to them. Perhaps, if Miss Brocklehurst was informed that she would be the thing that Harry would miss the most, she might be willing to at least hear him out. That's a good idea. Remus smiled. Are you sure they will all be all right? Dumbledore actually gave the former defense teacher a wry smile. My students' safety is my first concern. All the hostages shall be perfectly safe, or I will eat my hat. However, I can not say as much for the champions. Harry's going to be ready. Sirius said confidently. Yet, watching his godson leap into the lake, Sirius didn't feel as confident now as he had been the previous evening. He glanced over to the four Salem teens, who were each leaning forward in their seats. So, we're just supposed to sit here and watch the lake for the next hour. Mark said rather dejectedly. How are we supposed to know what's happening down there? Sirius was wondering the very same thing. Harry and the other champions had split up upon entering the water. Harry was amused to see Victor turn his head into that of a shark. Harry couldn't help but wonder if it would have been much more effective to give himself a tail as well. He could propel himself better. Both Cedric and Fleur had used bubble head charms, though Cedric had donned goggles, that Harry guessed were charmed to make it easier to see. Harry immediately headed towards the part of the lake he had yet to visit, keeping close to the surface to avoid Grindy Lowe's hidden in the high weeds. When he felt he had swam far enough, he began to dive deeper into the dark depths. It was so eerily quiet, and at the same time, oddly peaceful. Harry clutched his wand tightly in his webbed right hand, kicking easily as he kept his eyes open for any sign of the Mer village. He had thankfully not encountered any Grindy Lows, or any other obstacles. However, he was beginning to get annoyed that he'd yet to find anything. He went to check his watch, when he realized he'd left it in his room. He decided to dive a little lower when he heard it. A faint melodic voice. Harry turned on the spot, looking everywhere, but he saw nothing. But the sound persisted. Harry swam towards where he thought the sound was coming from. He felt he was getting closer as the sound became stronger, and in moments, found himself swimming under a stone archway. It was truly a sight to behold. There were around 20 mere people, more or less, hovering in what had to be the equivalent to a village square. Each one singing in the most melodic tones Harry could remember hearing in all his life. They were strange-looking creatures with large, round green eyes and long torsos. They all had long hair that best resembled spaghetti. Their arms looked strong despite their thinness. Harry passed several formations of rock that Harry thought must have been houses as he approached the group of mere people. They all watched him as he approached and Harry clutched his wand tighter in his hand. Then, he saw it. Four people suspended in the water, each width and length of what appeared to be seaweed tied to their ankles, all with their eyes closed. Harry wondered if he and the others were too late and those four had been killed. Panic struck his heart and he shot forward, grabbing for the first of the victims, 
which he now saw to be Gabrielle. He glanced at the others and saw that Cho was next to Gabrielle. He now understood why Cedric had looked so panicked that morning, or why he hadn't even seen Hermione, as she was next to Cho. And finally, Mandy. Harry's heart leapt to his throat as he swam over to Mandy. He touched her cheek gently, and his heart burned with anger that she was down here. He had to get her to the surface. He had to get them all to the surface. This was wrong, none of them deserved to have died down there for some stupid contest. Harry aimed his wand and tried to calm himself enough to focus. Dip into. He said, though only a mass of bubbles erupted from his mouth. However, the spell had worked. The seaweed was cut and Mandy floated up a little bit. He then aimed his wand at the slimy green rope attached to Hermione's leg. Suddenly, three of the mere people shot forward, thrusting spears into Harry's neck, though not hard enough to pierce his skin. You take only your own friend one of them hissed, and Harry was struck by how different the mermaids sounded when they spoke as opposed to sang. They're all my friends. Harry tried to say, though all that came out were more bubbles. Back off. There was a shriek of excitement and Harry turned to look where the other mere people were now pointing. Cedric had arrived, looking harried. He approached the group and immediately went for Cho, tugging at the strand of seaweed holding her down. Harry broke free of three guards and swam forward, using his wand to cut Cho free. Cedric gave him a very thankful look, and then tapped his wrist before carrying Cho to the surface. Harry went to free Hermione once again. This time, the apparently angered the mere people, who rushed forward again, telling him to take only his own hostage. Harry was getting angry now, but before he could do anything, Crumb arrived. Harry was never happier to see anyone in his life. Victor went to Hermione and tried to free her using his teeth. As before, Harry broke free of the guard and tapped Victor on the shoulder, pulling him back so he could get a clear shot. Once Hermione was free, Victor clutched Harry's shoulder, and pointed his snout up towards the surface. Harry nodded and watched as Hermione and Crumb disappeared into the murky water above. Harry turned and noticed that the mere people had now formed a circle around Gabrielle, shielding her from him. Harry turned on the spot hoping to see any sign of the last champion. He was beginning to run out of time. He could feel that the water was getting colder and darker. The gillyweed was wearing off, and he didn't have another dose. He wasn't sure that a bubble head charm would work if it were cast underwater. He'd never tried it before, and he didn't feel now was the time to try. He made up his mind, and raised his wand at the closest guard, and motioned for him to move aside. The guard refused, and Harry held up three fingers. One by one, he lowered a finger until none were left. He then sent a boiling jet of water at the guard who shouted in pain. The others backed away, and Harry freed Gabrielle. Taking her and Mandy by the arm, he began swimming straight up now. It was slow going now that he had both girls to carry, and what was worse, the gillyweed was wearing off much quicker now. Harry's heart was gripped in panic now as he could feel the water in his mouth. There was light ahead, and Harry knew he was close to the surface. He was going to make it. He was nearly there. And then, it happened. The gillyweed's effects ended and Harry took a great gulp of water. He tried to cough but more water entered, and he began to drown. Thinking quickly, he pushed the two girls towards the surface. He grabbed at his throat, and fought for the surface, but he was blacking out. 
he was going to die. His last conscious thought was the hope that Mandy and Gabrielle's bodies broke the surface as the blackness enveloped him in its sweet embrace. There was a pressure on his chest, and he coughed up a whole lot of water. He was rolled over on his side, and more water came up from his lungs. They burned as fresh oxygen filled them. Easy there, Harry. A voice said. Relax, let it come out on its own. Harry coughed and spluttered until no more water was in his chest and he was breathing again, though in great gasps. He was lying on the platform he'd dug off of at the beginning of the task, surrounded by onlookers. He began to sit up when his coughing subsided, and felt someone grab him by the shoulder. Always so dramatic. Harry looked to see Sirius looking at him with a soft smile. Guess I didn't have enough gillyweed. Harry gasped. Is he okay? Someone asked in panicked fright. Sirius smiled wider and stepped back. Harry was suddenly knocked back as a pleasant weight settled on top of him. Two slender, very wet arms wrapped around his neck threatening to choke him and a mass of sodden hair pressed against his face. I'm so sorry. Mandy cried as she held him tightly. I'm so very sorry. I've been so stupid. You're all right. Harry asked in shock when he recognized Mandy's voice. He looked up and saw that Cedric and Victor were standing above him, both looking very relieved. Not only that, they were standing with Hermione and Cho who were quite clearly alive and well, if not very cold from having been in the lake. He'd been sure that all the girls had been dead when he'd found them. They were only asleep, Sirius said, as Mandy helped him to his feet. Madame Pomfrey rushed forward now and wrapped a thick blanket around him, and forced a steaming spoonful of some strange liquid into his mouth. It burned his now raw throat on its way down. You risked your life for me, and for the others. Mandy said hugging him tightly again. The merfolk brought you up and we all thought you were dead. You really are incredible, and I'm so sorry I've been ignoring you. I've been so stupid. No. Harry said, his throat hurting as he spoke. I deserved it. No. Mandy shook her head. No, I overreacted. Luna told me that you'd been upset over everything, and I blew her off. I didn't want to get hurt anymore. Where is he? Someone else shouted, and the small crowd parted and Mandy pulled away from him as Fleur Delacour rushed forward and embraced Harry tightly. You saved her, even though she was not your to save. She has been right about you all along, and I am a complete fool. Fleur said in a rush. She kept on speaking, but now in French. Occasionally, she would pull away, holding his face as she spoke, before hugging him tightly again. When she finally was pulled off by Gabrielle, who came forward to embrace him, Harry was finally able to ask what had happened. I thought I was dead. He said looking to Sirius who was now shaking his head. A few more minutes, and you might well have been. Professor. Dumbledore said now entering the group. It was lucky that the mere people followed you to the surface. And while the chieftain is still a little upset that you gave him a rather nasty burn, he is very impressed with your desire to see all the hostages to the surface. They weren't dead. Harry asked as Mandy came closer to him, smiling at him, and reaching up to brush some wet hair off his forehead. Oh no, my boy. Simply in an enchanted sleep that broke the moment they broke the surface. My gods, do you have any idea what I was thinking? I thought they were dead. I thought we had all failed, and they had died because of this stupid tournament. They didn't enter, 
they didn't choose to be a part of this. How could you put them in danger like that? Harry motioned to the four hostages. Calm down, Harry. Sirius tried, but Harry gave him a dangerous look. I am sorry that you thought that the four ladies were in any danger, Harry. It was not our intention to make any of you believe that your friends would be hurt. Only to impress upon you the importance of getting through the task within the set time limit. I understand your anger, Harry. Sirius said, stepping forward and clutching Harry's shoulder firmly. But it won't make anything better. You have to let it go, all right. Harry nodded reluctantly, though he was still immensely irritated and Sirius patted his shoulder again. They all began to move off of the platform. Cedric and Victor both congratulated Harry and thanked him for his help under the lake. Hermione and Cho both hugged him tightly, both beaming at him with pride. Harry got his points and was excited, despite his anger over the whole damned thing, that he had once again pulled second place, as Karkaroff had scored him quite low. Harry guessed nearly dying had really counted against him. When Harry made it onto dry ground, he was greeted by a large group, led by Mark and Stacy, both of whom looked deeply pale and pleased that he was up and walking around. You don't ever do anything by half, do you? Mark said grabbing Harry by the shoulders. Victory or death, right. Do you have any idea how scary it was to see those girls come out of the lake and not know what happened to you? Stacy said angrily, punching Harry's arm. And then the mere people bring your body out of the water. I swear to God's James. Harry whatever your name is, if you ever do anything so stupid again, I'll kill you myself and save everyone a whole mess of time. There's still one more task, you know. Harry smiled. Stacy shrieked in indignation and punched his arm again. Harry couldn't help it, and he began to laugh along with Mark, who wrapped an arm around Harry's shoulder and led him and the others all back up to the castle. Please like and subscribe.